In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to you, O Lord, glory to you. O Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who are everywhere present and fill all things, treasury of good things and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity and save our souls, O good one. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy upon us. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten, begotten of the Father before all ages, light of light, true God of true God, begotten not created, of one essence with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became man and was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate and suffered and was buried on the third day, he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven. And he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who together with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the remission of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the age to come. Amen. Welcome to the Orthologia Orthodox Apologetics channel. I am your host, Skylar. So we're going to be continuing with our video series on the Glaphora, more specifically on Exodus. This is going to be a three-part series. Uh, part one was book eight, Exodus part one. This is going to be book nine of the Glaphora, volume two, Exodus part two. And then I'll do a third part for book ten. And I also have some blog posts that I've been doing on the Glaphora as well. And so, just getting to some introductory comments, uh, first of all, today is actually my birthday, and I thought, what better way to celebrate my birthday than do a video for you guys. So, that's what I'm doing. Like, I love making videos and blog posts for you guys, I really enjoy doing this. It's a lot of fun to learn and read and put what I learn into writing. So, I hope you guys enjoy this video. So, just as a reminder, here's a picture of the book I'm using for the video series and the related blog posts I've done. Uh, the heading for the series, right, is this is the Fathers of the Church series. I mean, they've got several uh, scholars and cl even clergy, I believe, on this board of directors for it. It's just a patristic series translating the writings of the ancient fathers and bringing them to modern English, so contemporary uh, people everywhere, like laity, non-Orthodox, right? People can read the writings of the oldest church, some of the older church fathers in English, because, I mean, a lot of times, right, some of these church fathers, right, some of our saints would write in Latin, Greek, Aramaic, right? And sometimes not all of their works have been translated into English. So a lot of times what people like Nicholas P. Lund do, Robert C. Hill, is they translate some of these ancient works into English, so that way they are more widely accessible and available. So this is actually a relatively new translation of the Glaphora. Uh, this specific one is within the past uh, three or four years, actually. And uh, again, I mean, people ask sometimes, well, is it really necessary to say St. Cyril of Alexandria, right? And here's the thing. So a lot of times, uh, saints actually have common names. So there is more than one Cyril. Uh, there was actually uh, Saint Cyril of Jerusalem who lived uh, around the same time, uh, maybe a few uh, decades earlier than Saint Cyril of Alexandria. Like, I think he was a little bit earlier, like mid fourth century. Uh, Saint Cyril of Alexandria became patriarch in 412 AD, I believe. So sometimes we give the city in which a saint was bishop or patriarch therein to just clarify which specific uh, Cyril we're talking about. Another common example would be uh, Gregory or Ambrose, of which we have numerous saints, like Mal Saint Ambrose of Milan, Saint Ambrose of Optina, Gregory Nazianzen, Gregory of Nyssa, we have Gregory Palamis. We have many saints with the first name of Gregory. So that's just a uh, minor digression. And again, so what is the Glaphora? Well, it's a commentary on the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy to show that the first five books of the Old Testament are Christological in nature. And it, this was one of the uh, first Old Testament commentaries that St. Cyril Alexandria wrote right after becoming patriarch. So he becomes patriarch in 412 BC, taking over for his uncle Theophilus. He was actually trained to be patriarch 
Uh, he knew it was going to happen at some point, just we aren't necessarily sure that he expected it to happen as soon as it did in 412. So he became a patriarch in 412 of Alexandria, and St. Cyril really wanted to focus on exegeting the scriptures, the Old Testament and the New Testament. His early uh, writing career is prolific, numerous uh, works that he penned, but almost all of them are uh, exegesis of the scriptures. And this is a little bit different, right? Because later on in the time of his patriarch, patriarchy, uh, time as patriarch, right? Uh, there was a famous bishop named Nestorius who actually was associated with the heresy of Nestorianism, a uh, heretical Christology. So later in his career, St. Cyril, as a contemporary of people like Theodoret of Cyrus and Saint C and uh, Nestorius, right, actually defended proper Christology and wrote against these heretical Christological beliefs. And his writings on Christology and proper Christology are some of his more famous and well-known writings. Those are usually what get translated the most into English and what most people are familiar with. So one famous work of that is uh, On the Unity of Christ, excellent book by St. Cyril Alexandria, right? But many people f tend to forget that uh, Christological writings are not the only thing that St. Cyril Alexandria contributed for us. He also write numerous uh, commentaries on the Old Testament and New Testament, which are excellent. Uh, he has a commentary on the Gospels of Luke and John, as well as the epistles like Romans, 1 Corinthians, Hebrews. Uh, now, some of his New Testament epistles are what we would consider fragments. You know, scholars believe that his New Testament commentaries were originally verse by verse, but unfortunately, we do not have uh, the entirety of what he wrote. We have, like, uh, only fragments of what he believed we wrote, but he believed we commented on the vast majority uh, as probably you could say verse by verse for his New Testament commentaries. But if you read his New Testament commentaries, right, on the New Testament epistles, it's going to be a little fragmentary. So some verses are going to be missing, skipped over, and that's just probably because we lost the manuscript of what St. Cyril wrote. But the Gospel of John uh, is a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. It's excellent. Very long, actually. I mean, some translations, depending on the font size, are going to be around a thousand pages. But it is excellent. He also has a commentary on the Gospel of Luke. That's, again, an excellent book. I, I did previous videos on his commentary on the Twelve Prophets. That is translated by Robert C. Hill, who is also involved in the Fathers of the Church series. Uh, Nicholas P. Lon, as I said last time, is a professor of Old Testament studies at Spurgeon's College in London. So that's enough introductory comments about St. Cyril and some of his works and what he wrote about. So just to recap, again, as I said previously, this is a three-part series on Exodus based on the commentary of St. Cyril of Alexandria. So if you have not watched part one, uh, feel free to do so. I, I give a little bit more information, background information on the Glyphra as well as my methodology or approach for this series. And just as a reminder, I, I was talking a little bit about how the Gospel of John and for St. Cyril Alexandria, his commentary on the Gospel of John is a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. The Glyphra, Elegant Comments, is the best translation in English. Uh, not a verse-by-verse -verse commentary, it's more thematic in nature. So in part one, the examples we looked at were Christ as a prophet like Moses and how Emmanuel himself is a perfect typology of Moses. And we ended it by examining the burning bush theophany in Exodus 3, very famous theophany, and how it is related to the incarnation. So what I'm going to have for you today is uh, three more in-depth examples. And then I'm going to give a, a concluding example based on the three miracles of Moses in Exodus. I mean, there are a couple more examples. I, I believe there's uh, five or six total examples. It's a little bit lengthy of a chapter, book nine. Uh, but I'm, I'm not going to discuss everything. If you'd like more information, more in depth, you want to read St. Cyril Alexandria for yourself, by all means, feel free to acquire the Glyphra for yourself and read it yourself. Again, you can find it on Amazon and other sellers. It's the Fathers of the Church series. Uh, excellent translation. Nicholas P. Lunn was very uh, convenient for us and actually puts the biblical citations that St. Cyril is referencing in his work. 
I mean, sometimes the church fathers knew the scriptures just so incredibly well by memory that sometimes they didn't always reference what verse they were quoting. They just knew the scriptures by heart and just assumed their audience would automatically know what exact verse they were quoting from. But again, it is a little helpful sometimes just to be able to look, okay, this is the verse quoting from, this is where it's found in the Bible, just as a quick reference. So the first example, right, that we're going to look at, continuing with Exodus, is going to be concerning the sacrifice of the lamb. So St. Cyril has a very good quote on page 29. This is at the beginning of book 9 of the Glyphra. I think it's a very good quote, actually. And he writes the following. In the inspired scripture, many thousands of wonderful and manifest images brightly reflect the power of the mystery. And what is this mystery that he's calling about? Well, the mystery he was referring to is that is that by Christ alone we have the power to escape the bonds of sin and death. So these images, thousands of wonderful and manifest images for St. Cyril or numerous, countless way, innumerable ways in the Old Testament in which Christ is foreshadowed, and more specifically, the sacrifice of the Lamb in Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 to 16, more commonly known as the Lord's Passover, is a prefiguration, a typology, a foreshadowing, if you will, of the cross and the crucifixion and the resurrection. Right, so there's going to be some uh, background information we got to get out of the way factually in order to help understand how this is going to be Christological and understanding St. Cyril's exegesis, right? His Christological interpretation, or spiritual, if you will. Spiritual and Christological are used interchangeably by uh, St. Cyril. Uh, factual or literal mean the same thing for his methodology. Uh, he lays this out in his commentary on the Twelve Prophets. So sometimes, uh, I mean, I don't really remember if he specifically mentions this specifically in the Glafer with respect to his spiritual factual distinction, but he does reference it in his commentary on the Twelve Prophets. So I'm just giving you that context to St. Cyril Alexandria's methodology and approach. So in Exodus 12, 1 to 4, Yahweh, right? Yahweh is a descriptive title for the triune God. The Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, and the Holy Spirit is Lord. This is referring to the triune God, right? He gives precise instructions for this lamb that is to be sacrificed. It's going to be perfect and without blemish. It also has to be male, right? Uh, that's very important. And one year old. Again, all these years and number figures that we see in the numerical figures when we read them in the scriptures are very important, right? And this is what we read in the first four verses of Exodus chapter 12. Now, I put benefit in quote marks because when, when we think about it, the sacrifice of the Passover lamb, right, you might be wondering, how is this going to benefit Israel, right? So the benefit of this sacrifice, if you will, is that if Israel does this and sacrifices the, a perfect and without blemish male and one-year-old lamb, as Yahweh instructed them to, he himself that is, the destroyer, the angel of the death, shall pass them by and spare the firstborn. Now, spare the firstborn is both human and animal of the Hebrews. And because the Is Egyptians did not do this, the firstborn of the Israel, of the Egyptians and their animal, so their livestock, their oxen, their goats, their donkeys would all be dead. Okay, this is what Yahweh is telling us in Exodus chapter 12, verses 12 to 13. So these are some of the basic facts of the passage. Uh, again, this is a little bit lengthy passage. So uh, I'm just going to focus on the Christological interpretation of it given by St. Cyril Alexandria. If you want to read Exodus 12, 1 to 16, you are more than welcome to. You just got to keep in mind that sometimes when Moses is writing the Pentateuch and we read the entire passage, I, I mean, it's good, right? But sometimes we can get distracted by the factual or literal sense, and sometimes it's helpful to look at the key details, right, of what's going on, what's happening, what's going on in these verses to better understand the Christological meaning, right? Because the Old Testament is Christological in nature. We're supposed to look ahead to the spiritual things of God and events to come in the New Testament, especially with regards to the Incarnation and the Cross. So we've looked at some of the basic facts concerning the sacrifice of the Lamb, and, you know, uh, you might be wondering, perhaps, why exactly St. Cyril is treating the Lord's Passover, right, 
why he's treating this passage from Exodus 12 as Christological, and I'm going to endeavor to explain why he's arguing this on the final on the following slide. So as you can see, we're going to be talking now about why the sacrifice of the lamb is Christological. So again, he has all these parallels that he draws out. Again, just as the ritual being discussed, right, the ritual of the sacrifice of the Passover lamb is defined as being at the beginning of the year in the first month, so Christ is the beginning of all things, for he's not of recent origin on account of his generation from God the Father before age, all age, before the ages. Again, Christ is eternal. He has always existed. He is co-eternal to the Father and consubstantial, right? And I continue, and as the festival was in the month of new growth, now new growth is actually the month of abib in Hebrew, and abib means new growth when it's best translated literally into English. So that's why St. Cyril is saying this. And he himself sanctifies throughout all time from the beginning until the end, right? The Lord's Passover in Exodus 12 is going to be an annual ritual, customary ritual in the ancient Jewish liturgical calendar. So the cross is once and for all time. And again, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the old things have passed away. And just as so too in Christ, human nature was restored to how it was in the beginning. And you can find this on page 32 of book nine of the Glafra. Right, so just as the Passover lamb being sacrificed spared the firstborn of the Hebrews from the angel of death or the destroyer, so too does the cross free all of humanity from the bondage of sin and death and grant us eternal life and a new beginning in Jesus Christ. So just as the Hebrews themselves were enslaved at the time of Passover, just as those at the time of the crucifixion were slaves to sin, the Lamb is taking on the tenth day of the month, not the first, which for St. Cyril indicates the length of slavery and bondage to sin prior to the Incarnation and the crucifixion was a lengthy period of time, right? Moses may have lived around 1300 BC, you know, Job and Abraham are probably uh, around 1600 BC, maybe a little older than that. So that was a very long time, right? Thousands and thousands of years between the events and the guarding of eating until we get to the birth of Jesus Christ in the gospel, in the gospel accounts to us, right? But even so, God eternally is and always had a plan of restoration for us. Jesus Christ came exactly what when he did. This was always the Father's plan for restoration, the plan of the Father and Son before the create foreordained before the creation of the world. So all of Israel in Exodus 12 is told to sacrifice a lamb as a tilios, a complete, perfect, or full, right? Just as Christ dwells in each one of us through the partaking of the Holy Spirit, and he is not divided per 1 Corinthians 1 13, as the Apostle Paul tells us. Indeed, you know, just as the lamb for the Lord's Passover was perfect and without blemish, so too in Christ there are all the proper marks of deity. And Christ implanting within us all the seeds of divine knowledge. For again, who can reveal the Father to us, save for he of whom is God by nature and eternally wills to reveal him to us? And so Jesus makes humanity perfect through the gospel teachings. And again, the Lord's Passover is repeated annually. This is an annual liturgical uh, observance in the ancient Jewish liturgical calendar, right? And in the same way, we observe and celebrate Pascha annually, but the actual physical, literal event of Pascha, right? Jesus Christ was only crucified and resurrected from the dead on the third day a single time. He died once on the cross for all time, okay? And Holy Communion for St. Cyril represents the eating of the bread and the sacrificial lamb, for through the application of the blood, we keep far from us the demon who had designs against us and put to death the passions arising from carnal affections, right? The communion brings us and unites us to the all-holy and consequential trinity. In it, we denounce the Satan, the slander, Satan, the slander, the devil, the evil one, the accursed one, and the unclean deep multitude of unclean demons who have designs and do not desire our salvation and want to drag us into hell and away from our glorious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so by participating in Holy Communion, by participating in the sacramental life of the church, we are putting to death the passions arising from carnal affections, right? And carnal affections is actually going to come up a little bit later when we talk about the manna and the quail. Uh, again, sometimes in Numbers, Moses narrates the same story twice, 
as he's narrating in Exodus. But when he adds additional details to us in Numbers, it enhances our ex understanding of what is occurring in num Exodus, right? So it's actually very important. It's not vain repetition for in that sense. So again, just a, a final thing. I think this is a very good quote by St. Cyril. So this is going to be our final slide for concerning the sacrifice of the lamb. So I quote, St. Cyril writes the following. It orders them to eat the head with the legs and the entrails. This is what Yahweh says to us in Exodus 12. So this means that the entire knowledge of the mystery pertaining to Christ is to be received into the minds of believers. For it is necessary to know, first of all, that the word being God was there in the beginning, in the Father and with the Father, that he is the head, the beginning of all mystery. Then secondly, that is God also, he will come again as judge, bringing an end to our present economy. For this is what the feet symbolize, being the end parts of the whole body. And by the entrails, you are to understand the word being hidden, as it were, within his incarnation. By means of such things, therefore our faith is complete, and Christ is whole and complete in us through such knowledge. It is for this reason it seems to me that John said, who is, who was, and who is to come. This occurs multiple times in the book of Revelation. This quote is found on page 39, assuming you use the same uh, translation of the glyphra that I was using. Again, the picture of the book I used was on the introductory slide. If you want to go back to the beginning, it's the Fathers of the Church here. He's translated by Nicholas P. Lund. So indeed, the cross is a Passover right? Because we pass over from a worldly, li worldly life to a life devoted to the love of God. We crucify the desires and passions of the flesh. For truly, truly, Christ restores us to the estate of which man had at the beginning prior to the fall. He restores us to greatness. He restores, frees us from the bondage of sin and death. Uh, the cross is the perfect manifestation of Yom Kippur, right? So it's only fitting that the, you know, Right after the crucifixion, the veil in the temple stopped changing color. Yom Kippur was no longer able to be observed. I mean, yeah, the Jews, the high priest still tried to celebrate Yom Kippur after the crucifixion, but it was impossible in the years between the crucifixion and the destruction of the temple by the Romans in 70 AD. If the veil of the temple does not change color, the high priest had no way of knowing if they did Yom Kippur correctly or not. So it was just a ritual done in vain. Again, it was done in vain because Yom Kippur is meaningless after the crucifixion. Christ is the perfect manifestation and exaltation of Yom Kippur. Uh, Yol Nadin and uh, Kenami, uh, uh, many Jewish converts to Christianity echo this and teach similar things in their works. So our second example is going to be concerning the dedication of the firstborn, also found in Exodus. So in 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20, it says that we have indeed been redeemed from our former way of life, inherited from our forefathers, not with silver or gold, with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or defect. He was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times. Again, this verse from the, from the uh, epistle of 1 Peter just kind of summarizes in a way what we were talking about concerning the sacrifice of the lamb and its Christological meaning. So I thought it a fitting verse to segue into our second example, the dedication of the firstborn. So St. Cyril writes that while he was by nature God in the form of God the Father, and equal to him, the only begotten was also named the firstborn, appeared on earth and lived alongside humanity. Indeed, as the Lord says to the Father in heaven in Psalm 21, 23, LXX, the Septuagint, I will declare your name to my brothers in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praises to you. I mean, this clearly shows that having taken human nature upon himself, the Lord of all creation, the Son of God, the Anointed One, the Word, the member of the Logos, the Lord is not ashamed to call us his brothers. Through, through Christ, we have been called to adoption as sons, right? And this is what we're going to see in Exodus 13, verse 11 to 13, as well as Exodus chapter 22, verse 29 to 31. Okay, so the second example in the LXX is going to be slightly different numbering. It's actually going to be uh, 22 verses 28 to 30 in the Septuagint, okay, compared to the Masoretic. So Yahweh instructs the dedication of the firstborn, both of humanity and animals, in, to the Lord in order for the Israelites to become holy men to Yahweh. Okay, again, sometimes it is not always clear why someone would say such passages are Christological, but St. Cyril clearly explains why. We also have a connection to Holy Communion. You will become holy men to me, is what Yahweh says when you dedicate the firstborn of humanity and animals to the Lord. Just as we say in the Divine Liturgy, the holy gift for the holy people of God. That's what our priests say during every single Divine Liturgy when it is time to come up for, divine, for Holy Communion. And, uh...
Yeah, so I'm going to proceed and explain why this is Christological. I had one more point that I wanted to say, but I, I think it's actually going to be on the next slide. So why is this Christological? Well, look, St. Cyril writes the following. For when the firstborn of the Egyptians perished, every household of the beloved Israel was saved and escaped the destroyer, the angel of death. Okay, this is the son of God. He is both the judge of the living and the dead. He, starting times in the Old Testament, he came in retribution for to enact divine justice, like when he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah together with the father, right? When he destroyed Idumea, when he destroyed Nineveh, right? when he caused the flood in the days of Noah and sealed Noah in the ark. That's why the, the Son of God is also referred to as the destroyer by the church fathers. So, being anointed with the blood of the Lamb as a figure of Christ, we are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. And I continue, who on account entered among the dead in order that he might annul death. Christ frees us from the bondage of sin and death. So thus, those who have been saved are no longer properly their own, but rather it is fitting that he who put himself in peril on their behalf should henceforth obtain them as his own. So again, just as I was saying, right, even though Jesus Christ comes as a destroyer at starting points in the Old Testament, he did not come in retribution with respect to the Incarnation, he came to save humanity and save mankind. But when he returns at his second coming, he's going to return as the destroyer to judge the living and the dead and exact divine justice. So if you do not follow Christ, right, you really need to follow Christ before he comes back, because when he comes back the second time, it's going to be too late for repentance. Your fate is sealed and finalized. So indeed, we are bought by the precious blood of Christ, as 1 Peter 1, 18-20 says, and we are made sons of God through faith, just as the Father, the Son says to the Father in Psalm uh, 22, 18. And just as the Hebrews would become holy men to God, or Yahweh, so too do the faithful, being joined to Christ in holy baptism and dedicating their lives to Christ, become holy, not by nature, but through free will and sanctification through the Holy Spirit. Just as the firstborn is dedicated to God, so too is the newly baptized and those preparing for baptism, dedicated to the Lord, brought up within the church, and taught the faith. We are born again through the faith and the teachings of the church, and the scriptures are but spiritual milk for us, right? This is spiritual milk. Catechism is spiritual milk. Studying the scriptures, studying theology, praying, this is all spiritual milk that helps us grow closer to God and nourishes and sustains us. And again, with the thing to understand with the law, right, is this points ahead, right? You know, God was therefore unapproachable by means of the ministration of the law, but he became approachable only through Christ. So it is Jesus Christ who makes us perfect. It is Jesus Christ who brings us to the Father. It is Jesus Christ who brings us into perfect communion with the all-holy and constable Trinity. The Son, the incarnation of the only begotten, right, brings us to perfect and complete knowledge of the all-holy and consubstantial Trinity and frees us from the bondage of sin and death. Apart from the Son of God, without the incarnation, knowledge is impossible and there is only death and destruction, okay? So this is all very important to read. So there's a little more that St. Cyril talks about. If you want to know more about why the dedication of the firstborn is Christological in nature, if you're unsure, you can feel free to find uh, this section of the Galatia Book 9 on your own, either acquire the book and you might be able to find a PDF. Some of his works are all available for free on online PDFs. So you're more than welcome to do that. And now for our third example is concerning the manna and the quails in Exodus. So the manna and the quails from heaven is in Exodus 16, 1 to 29. Again, this is a pretty lengthy passage. I'm not going to read all 29 verses for you. If you want to check out all 29 verses, you, I mean, you're more than welcome to. I'm just going to highlight some select verses from these 29 verses, as well as the account from Numbers. And, you know, again, our God will provide for us, sustain, and nourish us, right? And there's much more than just a factual understanding, as we've seen so far in this video with the two examples we discussed thus far, and in the previous video on Exodus. So in what manner are we going to be able to say that the manna and quails given in the wilderness are Christological? So the first thing we need to understand for St. Cyril is by this means we will also learn how the way of life under the law is undoubtedly inferior to that under the gospel. The former was not free from accusations of carnality, nor was it 
delivered from earthly desires, but the divine way of life under the gospel is spiritual and flawless, having incomparable beauty. Right? The whole point of the gospel is to free us from carnality, the desires and pleasures of the flesh, the pursuit of earthly living indulgences, right? Strive for theosis, become one with the all holy and consummate trinity, make God the preeminent focal point of our lives. This is what Moses is trying to tell us in the book of Exodus. And there is a reason why the manna came in the morning, why the quail, quails came in the evening, save for that as a sixth day, right? The Israelites were commanded only to gather manna and quail for a single day and not save any for the morning. Okay, double was given on the sixth day because God did, said he was not going to send manna and quail on the Sabbath. They would have to grab food for the Sabbath day on the sixth day. And if it's day four, right, the fourth day of the week, and the Israelites are greedy, and they try and grab extra manna and quail, it's going to rot and become infested with worms, they're going to become sick, and they'll die, and they'll perish. And that's what happened to a vast majority of the Israelites in the wilderness. They died from avarice and gluttony and greed as a punishment from God. So why are the manna and quails Christological? So the quail represents that God will provide for the Israelites, and Israel wanted the meat of the Egyptians. They craved for the flesh of meat, and the mind of the Jews was feeble and easily overcome by the assault of the passions, for it had a love of the things of the flesh and yielded to the more earthly concerns, as St. Cyril says, because this is exactly what Moses tells us in Numbers 11, 4-6. This is what Moses writes. The rabble that was among them had a strong craving, uh, uh, rabble can also be can translated as mixed multitude, but already we're not giving a good uh, descriptive moniker for these Jews that are grumbling and complaining in the wilderness. And they had a strong craving, and they and the people of Israel sat down and wept and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, and the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our appetite is gone. There is nothing before our eyes except this manna. And Moses heard the people of every family weeping, each at the entrance to their tent. Then the Lord became exceedingly anger, and the manner was evil in the sight of Moses. Okay, look, God is going to provide for us. Yahweh said he would provide for the Israelites, but he is upset, okay? The Israelites are ungrateful, wretched people. They despise God. Moses was holy and righteous, but most of the Israelites are ungrateful sinners. They're evil, terrible people, okay? So they despise God. They hated him. They were cursing God because he was only giving them manna. And manna is bread of heaven. It is a typology of the bread of life, which Jesus Christ gave at the Last Supper, and which was broken and, and poured out for us with his blood on the cross for the remission of sins. So quail represents the desires of the flesh. For St. Cyril, uh, God gives quail simply to show that he is omnipotent and he can do anything and everything. So he did it to satisfy the Israelites and hopefully cause them to turn back to the Lord and stop being ungrateful, wicked sinners. But this didn't happen. So when Israel became birds, they actually became very greedy. They devoured in gluttony. They just wanted to eat an all-you-can-eat buffet of quails. They got extremely sick. You know, thousands and thousands and thousands of Israelites in the wilderness died from gluttony were punished with a disease, a terrible disease, like almost like the bubonic plague from Yahweh. So the quail is teaching Israel that they have to trust and rely on the Lord rather than that of the Egyptians, that is to say mankind or the world itself, and show that nothing is impossible for God. This is why St. Cyril concludes that God did this. So God is given provide for his sheep, and he did promise a new covenant per Jeremiah 31, 31, through the Messiah that would be perfect in every way, right? But the manna is supposed to be the only food that was meant for the wilderness. It was only supposed to be manna. Quail was given because the Israelites were wicked sinners. Okay, the quail comes at night again because the Jews trusted the desires of the flesh and didn't care about God. They didn't care about the Holy Spirit, right? They didn't care about Moses. They thought the manna of heaven, which is a typology of the bread of heaven or the bread of life, which is Jesus Christ, which nourishes and sustains us eternally because the light of the world frees us from the darkness, hence why the manna was given in the day. So the manna is the teachings and spiritual gifts that come through Jesus Christ. So just as the Israelites in the wilderness reject the teachings and spiritual gifts from Yahweh, they would reject the spiritual and 
gifts and teachings of Jesus Christ when he came in the flesh, and Jesus is the most perfect spiritual food because he's brought us to complete and perfect knowledge of the all-holy and constable trinity. So the manna came every single day, except for the Sabbath, and Christ is he of whom is eternally present and eternally sustains and nourishes our souls, per John 6, 49-51. Again, just as the Jews of old despised the manna in the wilderness, they hated the manna. The Jews at the time of Christ rejected the Savior, rejected the spiritual and heavenly things of God, and hated the Lord of all creation. And Moses was actually revealed about the crucifixion, the incarnation, the resurrection. Uh, he knew all this stuff, everything that was going to happen in the New Testament. He just didn't necessarily understand all about it. It was confusing to him. But Moses actually writes... Would that all the Lord's people were prophets when the Lord shall put his spirit upon them in Numbers 11.29. This is foretelling Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to us in the New Testament. So the Jews who were extraordinarily jealous of those saints in Christ would do well to remember that Moses was a Trinitarian. Moses delighted in the restoration of the Gentiles who became zealous and justified through faith and sanctified by the Spirit. Moses' wife Zipporah is a Midianite, a Gentile. She is not a Hebrew. Okay. And in Christ, all things are made anew. There is neither Jew nor Greek. We are all one in Christ Jesus. So again, uh, it's very important to keep in mind in regards to the manna and quail. Manna is the bread of life. We eat the body and blood of our glorious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For in doing so, we reclaim his death until he returns or calls us home. By eating the flesh of the Son of Man and drinking his blood, we have life. But if we do so in an unworthy manner, we are uh, bringing condemnation upon ourselves. And again, avarice and greed, right, and gluttony, that's going to kill you physically and spiritually, right? You know, if you're more concerned about having the finest fruits, the finest spices, the finest vegetables, and all these earthly pleasures over studying the word of God, studying theology, and growing closer to God, I mean, you're making a very, very big mistake, and you are just as bad as the Israelites in the wilderness, and look what happened to them. They died. Moses was righteous. A select few of the Israelites were loyal to Yahweh and followed Moses, but again, most of them were sinners, and they were not saved in the slightest way. In any sense. So just as a conclusion, uh, there are some other examples from Book 9 that I didn't mention so far, like Mara and the tree therein, as well as the three miracles of Moses. But I'm going to mention the circumcision of Moses' son Gershom in Exodus 4, 26 because it's very important. Here's a lengthy passage from St. Cyril Alexandria. Now an angel came in our form and sought to kill Moses, but was just about thwarted when Zipporah circumcised her son Gershom, who was also the firstborn, and whose name means sojourner. Why the destroyer tried to kill Moses, the sacred scripture does not explicitly state, but it is only by this circumcision of the child that he was prepared to be made to leave. So the figure again makes it clear how death was conquered by the blood of Christ, and the holy multitude of the fathers, or rather the whole of the race that was there from the beginning before Christ, has been saved. For he died for all, and the death of all has been undone in him. For it is not for it was not by the blood of the prophets, but by the blood of the much younger or more recent Christ that we escaped the destroyer together with him. For to this end it says Christ died and came to life that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. So again, uh, Moses is freed from death because he circumcised his son Gershom like he was supposed to. The one who actually circumcised Gershom is his wife Zipporah with a stone. So it's not circumcision of the flesh that, according to the law, that saves us, but circumcision through the Spirit and in Christ, which is that of Holy Baptism. Circumcision is of the flesh is nothing. It's powerless to save. Okay? And we are sojourners on earth, just as Gershom's name means sojourner. The spiritual Zipporah, that is the wife of Moses from a Midianite, it represents the church, and that is of whom baptizes us, not the law. The church baptizes us. And the stone prefigures the Godhead because God is strong and indestructible, just like a rock. And our third and final video is going to be on Exodus. Our, I'm sorry, our third and final video on Exodus is going to be Book 10 of the Glyphra, and St. Cyril entitles this Exodus Part 3. 
Uh, that's all I have for you today. Thank you for watching. Uh, also, in the future, I'm going to be starting a new series on famous women of the Bible, like Hannah, St. Veronica, uh, Mary Magdalene, and others. So I'm a little excited about that. Thank you for watching. As always, God bless and have a great day.